Have you ever been sold a lemon? I remember the first car that I bought was this Toyota Camry. Uh, someone had recommended a used car lot that was local and uh, went, bought this car, couldn't wait to get one. And so this just kind of spoke to me and, and I bought it. Uh, it was in summer. We got to winter and went to turn on the heater for the first time in the car and it only blew cold air. That's weird and stuff. I uh, had a look under the bonnet, all the pipes seemed to be attached. Okay, well, I've got to take it to a mechanic, took it to the mechanic. He said, oh, the, the your, your pipes are all connected to the wrong thing. It should come out of the radiator into the heating system and so on. So the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the cooling fluid travels through and it's cooled down. Anyway, so uh, reconnected it all. Uh, then um, a few weeks later noticed there was a big wet patch on the passenger side floor and the car was overheating quite regularly uh, and uh, steam coming at the bonnet oh, something's wrong top that up that's getting wetted down there top that up turned out that uh, the reason the pipes had been reconnected uh, and it hadn't been connected to the heating system was because there was a hole in one of the hoses uh, that um, were never got fixed in the end. Uh, there was some reason that the connection point had split and so the car cooling fluid was seeping out into the floor well of the passenger side of the car and so I just had to live without heating at all in the car, which was freezing cold. I remember I was a student minister in Ingleburn driving from the city before the M5 was built uh, for two hours, sometimes on a Friday afternoon, wearing gloves and a parka uh, while this thing's blowing cold air in my face. <laughs> anyway, uh, I had to learn a lesson. Um, in our passage today, uh, something is sold to the Israelites that's not all they're cracked up to be. We learn something about keeping your word, about what the Lord expects, uh, and uh, how to move forward. Uh, and so let's pray and we'll get into Joshua chapter 9. Father, thank you for your word. And we pray, please, that you'll help us to uh, understand what to do in situations where we give our word, uh, even if what we're expecting is not what we thought it might be. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're in Joshua chapter 9. And we pick it up at verse 1. When all the kings heard about Jericho and I, those who were west of the Jordan in the hill country, in the Judean foothills, and all along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea toward Lebanon, the, he the Heathites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, they formed a unified alliance to fight against Joshua and Israel. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they acted deceptively. They gathered provisions and took worn out sacks on their donkeys and our wineskins, cracked and mended. They were old patch sand they sorry, they wore old patch sandals on their feet and threadbare clothing on their bodies. Their entire provision of bread was dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. The men of Israel replied to the Hivites, Perhaps you live among us. How can we make a treaty with you? He said to Joshua, We are your servants. Then Joshua asked them, Who are you and where do you come from? They replied to him, Your servants have come from a faraway land because of the reputation of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two Amorite kings beyond the Jordan, King Sihon of Heshbon and King Og of Bashan, who was in Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our land told us, take provisions with you for the journey. Go and meet them and say, we are your servants. Please make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we took it from our houses as food on the day we left to come to you. But see, it's now dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we, were, when we filled them, but see, they are cracked. And these clothes and sandals of ours are worn out from an extremely long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but did not seek the Lord's decision. So Joshua established peace with them and made a treaty to let them live. 
and the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. Three days after making the treaty with them, they heard that the Gibeonites were their neighbours living among them. So the Israelites set out and reached the Gibeonite cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Shepherah, Beeroth and Kiriath-Jerim. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the community had sworn on oath to them by the law of the God of Israel. Then the whole community grumbled against the leaders. All the leaders answered them, We have sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This is how we will treat them. We will let them live so that no wrath will fall on us because of the oath we swore to them. They also said, We'll let them live. So the Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers for the whole community as the leaders had promised them. Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said to them, Why did you deceive us by telling us you live far away from us when in fact you live among us? Therefore you are cursed and will always be slaves, woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. The Gibeonites answered him, It was clearly communicated to your servants that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. We greatly feared for our lives because of you, and that is why we did this. Now we are in your hands. Do to us whatever you think is right. This is what Joshua did to them. He rescued them from the Israelites, and they did not kill them. On that day, he made them woodcutters and water carriers, as they are today. For the community and for the Lord's altar at the place he would choose. That's a, a strange turn of events in the middle of uh, this conquest of the land. We've been seeing how God told Joshua to fulfill what he told to Moses and to even 400 years ago to Abraham to go and conquer this land and destroy everyone among them. And these people, uh, what, 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 there's two different responses, aren't they? At the start, we read one response of uh, the uniting of the nations against the people of God, against the people of Israel. Uh, and so there's this game. We haven't heard the consequences of that yet. Uh, but there's a second response from this minority group from some of the Gibeonites, not all of them, because uh, the uh, the Hivites, the Gibeonites are Hivites. The Hivites have joined in the, the big coalition army against Israel, but a small group called the Gibeonites of the Hivites come as representing people of three small cities. Uh, and so perhaps 60,000 people uh, are, are represented by this little, uh, by this group. They come and they uh, make out that they have come from a faraway land, that they've heard of the Lord's reputation. They want to live as strangers amongst the people of God. Uh, and uh, they go through quite an elaborate deception to prove to Israel just how far away they've come from, how long it's taken them to get there with the wineskins, with the bread, uh, with the sandals of the feet. All of them are old and crusty and uh, not really edible. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, the Israelites accept the, the story and they make a treaty with them, a pact. They swear an oath before the Lord. And so there's a few things going on there, isn't it? That um, One is um, how seriously God takes our oaths. Uh, and so when you promise to do something, you've got to be a person of your word. And, and in the end, Joshua is caught by the words of the people. But we also learn that... Um, th that um, uh, the people of God can be fools, right? God doesn't make things so that we don't uh, ever get tricked, scammed or, or anything like that. Uh, these people have come not to kind of rip them off, but to preserve their own lives so you can understand why they've come. In one sense, they've done better than the, the other groups of the inhabitants who want to just say, no, we're going to fight against it. We're going to rail against it. They're, these guys are self-protective and so on but the biggest mistake in it all from israel's point of view is that they didn't inquire of the lord they had the mechanism we've seen how they could inquire of the lord and come to conclusions uh they, there's instructions in the law of how to do it and so on come occasions cast lots on others use the human and thuman the high priest gear uh he's got uh ways of um, determining god's will and joshua um, is in communion with the Lord himself. And at no point did any of the Israelite leaders stop and think, 
well, let's ask God about this. And so they're great, two great failures. One is to believe everything, well, they're, they're told. But the, the biggest one is that they didn't go to God. They didn't bring this situation before God and say, what should we do with these people? Father, give us wisdom. Now, there might not have been an answer, but presumably in their situation where there is this communication and they have the tools, God would have given them the answer. But they are foolish and godless. And the Gibeonites, as it turns out, are more godly. They've, well, they're more of fear of the Lord uh, than even the Israelites at this point. It's easy to get to a point where you've been successful and a few things have gone well and all of a sudden you're not relying on God anymore. And so, But they've given their oath and so when they find it they've been deceived, uh, it ends up that they have to keep their word. And, and that should be the case for all of God's people too, that we are to be truth tellers. Uh, Jesus will say don't, you don't need to swear by Jerusalem or by heavens or by anything, right? No making pinky promises or God promises. You know, you just let your yes be yes and your no be no. And if you become a person of truth, and and Joshua wants to be that, right? And and he he wants the people to be that. And he says, actually, it's worse for us if we break our oaths than if we um if we uh, go and punish them for their deception amongst us. But notice there are consequences both ways. Uh, now Israel are going to have one of these groups of people who live in the land, whose sins have reached the full measure, who God has determined to destroy. They're going to be now living among them as their servants, uh, the woodcutters and water carriers uh, for the rest of their days. Notice there's a permanency to the arrangement that's there as a curse. God, Joshua calls it a curse. I'm cursing you. Um, and that's why they end up in this situation. But it's interesting because uh, with the cities that he's made this deal arrangement with are the cities of Gibeon, Chephirah, Beeroth, and Kiriath Jerim. Now, that may not mean much to you, but at least two of those are going to be significant in the future. Gibeon, uh, there's going to be interaction with them around the kingship. Uh, but Kiriath Jerim. Uh, in the book of Samuel, when uh, the the Israelites have sinned against the Lord, the priests are drunkards and uh, sexual manipulators, uh, and it's a horrible situation. They carry the ark in the battle, uh, thinking that it's a magic talisman because Joshua's day and in Moses' day, it's you know, it caused the water to dry up and it brought the walls of Jericho down. And this is our magic talisman in battle. But they lose the battle and lose the ark to the Philistines. The Philistines, it all goes badly for them. And it's quite a funny story uh, um, of how they decide they're going to return the ark. They fill it with uh, all sorts of tributes and gold uh, to Yahweh. And they put it on the back of a cart and, and some bulls. And they send it off into the hills, uh, aiming it towards Israel. And in the end, it winds up in the hands of the men of Kiriath Jerim. Uh, you can see that in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 5 or 6 around there. Uh, the, so these guys become the protectors of the ark of God, the very presence of God for many, many years, many, many years until uh, there's kings um, and a temple built. Uh, and so it actually is a good thing in the end not just for the Gibeonites that they got to live and the men of Kirijim, the these guys here, but also they are going to honour their promise as the Israelites should have. And so they end up keeping their word in a, and just as Joshua has to keep his word and they're going to graciously, now that they've become servants, be the servants of Israel into the future. Uh, it will create problems because of having Canaanites in land who will tempt them away as well from the Lord their God. But these guys know that God is God, that he is the one who's given the victory and that everyone should put their lives in his hands just as Israel should have done that day. They should have prayed. And so we can learn from that. Always go to God. Uh, never trust people when they come bearing gifts. Uh, and you might be sold a lemon, but if you give your word, keep it. Uh, no matter, even if it costs you. 
uh, learn from this lesson. Let's pray. Father, we pray, please, that we would always be people who are both putting our lives in your hands and coming to you in prayer and for wisdom and decisions, but also we'd be people who keep our word. Help us when we get ripped off not to break our word, uh, but to fulfill our promises. And so, but Father, please protect us from these kind of situations. Help us to, to be wise, to think before we act and to pray before we act, to seek your face, to seek your wisdom, to reflect uh, before making big, important decisions like this that are going to impact us. Thank you for the Gibeonites that in the end they did keep their word and they became protectors of uh, your treasures and uh, for the way that uh, you bless them through uh, this horrible situation. Uh, Father, we pray, please, that you'll help us to be wise and discerning in all that we do for your honour and glory and help us never to be so proud that things have gone so well as Christians that we can live without prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone. Catch you for another devotion tomorrow.